everyone. Hello. We, we welcome you very, very warmly to our session in this year's ESOF 2020 uh, careers program with the uh, very catchy title, um, Would Einstein Get Hired Today? Uh, and uh, here's the three of us. Um, my name is uh, Barbara Deal. Uh, I am the director for um, innovation and transfer at the uh, Helmholtz Association of German Research Centers based here in Berlin. And my name is Barbara as well. I'm Barbara Janssens. I'm a career manager at the German Council Research Center um, in Heidelberg. And um, yeah, I'm a specialist in career development for um, doctoral and postdoctoral researchers. And Maurice Knightley is going to tell you all about what that has to do with entrepreneurship and design thinking. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maurice Knightley, and I'm speaking to you today from Dublin. I'm an entrepreneurial specialist at the UCD Innovation Academy. And I'm very happy to be with you this afternoon, and I hope you enjoy our, our session together. And in just a moment now, I'll begin to, to share my screen. So there we are. I hope you can all see my screen clearly. And you're, again, you're very welcome to this session today. You might indulge me for just one moment while I quote probably Ireland's greatest poet, uh, internationally known poet, W.B. Yeats, who said that education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. And I hope that we will give you a little light today and perhaps something that you will wish to look into more clearly and uh, investigate yourselves in your own time. And uh, uh, another great man said that I am neither clever nor especially gifted. I am only very, very curious from Albert Einstein. And I hope that we will whet your curiosity today and that we will investigate some issues around this idea of being curious. And I hope you enjoy the session. Now, we have a problem to be solved. We have lots of problems to be solved. We encounter problems to be solved all the time. But we have lots of problems to solve today, and we're going to try and solve one problem in particular. The problem I have to solve today is that we have a webinar here. And in our work, in all our works, in Bar both of the Barbaras and myself, we are used to interactive workshops where we see you, we hear you, we work together on solving problems uh, in things like de design sprints and hackathons. But we have an issue, don't we, is that we don't have an interactive situation here today. So I'm going to be a little bit naughty and a little bit innovative perhaps, uh, but I'm going to hack the system. And what I'm going to ask you to do, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd be so kind, is to join me on what's called Mural. Now this will take a little moment for you to do. Firstly, you will have to type a short URL into your browser. I would recommend that you use a Chrome browser uh, anything other than uh, the um, uh, Chrome is probably best. Uh, so I will share a, a short link with you, but you will need to write it down or type it and type it into another browser, and I'll meet you all in Mural. So here is the the link. I beg your pardon, yes, you've silenced the room, have you? Okay. Mm 
So I'm, I'm hoping uh, that you are able to type this uh, URL, this short bit.ly, into your chat box, or into your browser, rather, into your browser, and join us on Muro. It'll take you a moment or two, but we should be able to meet in Muro in a moment or two, as soon as you have typed this address into your browser. And we'll see you there very shortly. And I'm hoping that you will be arriving very soon. Please forgive no. us, ladies and gentlemen, we're just uh, migrating to Mural, and it's wonderful. I can see some of you arriving. So as I just want to give you a quick demonstration of Mural, uh, you can see that it's a whiteboard and you can zoom in and out of that whiteboard. On the bottom right hand side, you'll see a zoom and you'll see how large this board is. Uh, if you zoom out all the way, you'll see how, how large the board is. If you zoom, zoom in, we're back in the corner that we're working on. So what we're going to do here today is that we're going to try and solve a problem. And you can see that I've dragged a little problem onto the mural board. We can drag and drop onto a mural board. And the problem, we're going to try and solve a problem today, a problem to be solved. 
And the problem that we are going to try and solve today is the following. And I hope you're all ready for the problem. The problem is the biggest problems that you experienced in your educational experience from day one, the biggest problems that you had in your educational experience from day one. Over here on the left-hand side, you'll notice that there is a black bar. And if you press on the little one that says text, it's like a little square uh, with, the, with the corner turned up, you'll see that you can get a post-it note. And you can drag that post-it note over to, uh, the, um, to the board and write on it. Or you could drag in a photograph or you'll see a little images, which is like a little mountain and a sun. And you can bring in a photograph of anything you like. So I'm just going to bring in a photograph, which is one of the things that I remember as being quite a problem for me when I was a, uh, a schoolboy. School lunches were always terrible and unhealthy and really not very nutritious. And I've also had a background in food, and now I'm very concerned about the diets of school children. So that's what I would see as one of the problems in education. So what I'd like you to do now is to try to bring over a post-it note from the left-hand column, or bring in a photograph, or write on the post-it note what do you think some of the problems you experienced in your education from day one, all the way back to primary school, kindergarten, secondary school, university? What problems did you experience? We will give you a few and moments. These can, be, these can be very, you know, practical ones like. I had to carry uh, a lot of heavy books to school or, or um, when uh, it was a very long, I, it was a very long commute and I always missed the bus. Um, so we encourage you to be, you know, to, to think about it and say, well, what was that one thing that always, uh, that I always bothered me either, you know, with school directly or on your way to school or the school of the, the educational experience that you had. Okay, here we go. We have the first one. Reap, wonderful. Road-based learning. I'm going to drag that post-it note, if you allow me. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Great. You have I guess this really it. looks great. So if I, if I can just kindly briefly interrupt, because I believe maybe some of the, the people in the audience have not had the time to copy down the link to the mural site. So Maurice, could you maybe uh, tell them again what the link is to the mural so that we can continue? Yeah, maybe just share your screen again, just very briefly uh, with, the, um, with the link. Just a moment now, and I'll, uh, I'll try to do that. But that will require us me to share my screen again. Yeah. So screen. Yeah, I'm sorry, because I really realized that it's only the video on. So if possible, I would leave the link really on, and we can keep talking. It doesn't matter. But Barbara, I have to be on mural, so I yeah. can't be sharing my screen. Ah, because you're on a laptop. Yes, I understand. So but then let me copy it, yeah, that I at least... So if I'm sharing my screen, I can't see the mural board. Yeah, I understand. Good. So okay. just for... Put it the... online, please. Yeah. So we, um, for all those latecomers to the session, we welcome you. And we would kindly ask you to visit the website that you're just seeing on the shared on the screen. Great, we have 15 people there. Excellent, that's fantastic. And what we're doing is we are sharing on the, on the mural board problems that we encountered during our education, all the way back from kindergarten, primary school, secondary school, what problems did you have? What were the issues? 
What were the annoying things? What really bugged you? What do you think is a problem for school kids, for students, for third level students, for PhD students, postdocs, everyone? What are the problems that we encounter in the education system? Okay, so I can just read you a few of the things that have already been posted. Okay, no so I'm just, go I'm just going to stop sharing my screen again here yeah. so that you'll be able to see me and, uh, and I'll be right back to you in mural. Yeah. So here I am back on mural and we've all sorts of wonderful problems. Boring teachers. I hope we're not, I'm not a boring teacher today. Teach it is not very interactive. Not so many problems, except perhaps some gender bias. Uh -huh. Where do you see that? Right. I don't see that, gender bias. I'm yeah. reading from the mural board. You can yeah, zoom in and out. Can. On the okay. bottom right-hand corner of the, of the, of the uh, screen, you'll see a, uh, a zoom in and out, and it will allow you to see more of the screen. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, we are 16 now. Excellent. So these are things that bug you, perhaps. What bugged you when you were in, in, in school or in college? There's my little picture of a bug. I just saw it. It's moved again a little bit. And really what we're doing here, folks, and while you're working away on that, I can just tell you a little bit more that we are, what we're doing in a way is we're, in, we're coming up with problems. We're really trying to understand what the issues are. We're trying to empathize perhaps with our users. So in this case, we're empathizing with uh, school children, students, uh, university students, and we're trying to find a problem to be solved. And we do that in many different ways. We can do it from our own experience, but we can go and ask our users. We can go and ask people what problems they experienced. We can empathize with them. We can learn from them and we can listen and we can observe and we can research and we can actually experience what they experience. We can go and walk a mile in their shoes as the expression goes. I'm just sharing a little photograph with you there that I hope you can see. I'm just going to make it a little bit bigger. And if you zoom out a little bit, you'll see this photograph that I've shared that I find really interesting. If you zoom out, you'll see it. And this is a, an empathy suit that people uh, who are trying to experience what it is to feel old. How is it when your joints are not as mobile as they were before? What if when your sight is impaired, when your mobility is impaired, when your joints don't, are not as flexible? And that's real empathy. That's really understanding a user, in this case, a group of elderly or what it is to feel old. So I hope you're enjoying Mural. I hope you're enjoying zooming in and out and seeing everything that people are writing. And I'm just going to read, read no work-life balance, rote-based learning in school, lack of knowledge when it comes to opportunities outside academia, demotivated teachers, judgmental attitudes, fantastic. There's a hell of a lot of problems to be solved. And isn't it great fun for us all to slag off education for a little while today? <laughs> we all work and live in education, and it just gives us an opportunity to do that. So uh, I'm going to, uh, to move on a little bit because we're going to do another little exercise. And while we're doing this, Barbara uh, is, uh, and is going to tidy up our board a little bit and make it look a little bit tidier so that we can see, are there themes emerging? Are there things that are the same? Are we, can we move these into little clusters that are interesting or that will give us some, some topics or some shared uh, problems?
So this is what we describe as the empathy stage, where we're really trying to understand what, what the problems might be that we are trying to solve. And I'll share another image with you just now on the mural board and make it a little bit bigger so that you can see it. And again, it's back to Einstein. And Einstein said, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about the solution. So this real deep empathy and understanding of the problems to be solved is the first and perhaps the most important uh, phase of our activities today, this empathy and understanding. So now what we're going to do, once you've had a few moments, and you can continue to uh, post more problems if you wish. Hope so I see some it. clusters emerging here already. So oh, yes. we have, you know, we have uh, clusters around um, around teachers, um, around you know boring teachers, zero accountability for teachers. Maybe I would put the demotivated teachers in there as well, a disciplinarian attitude, so punishing. Um, then we have um, a cluster around methods, so around road learning, no room for creativity, too much theory, not enough application. So, um, and um, then we have, yeah, so we have one around no free time, no work-life balance, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then we have, let me see, there are two very big ones that I'm just going to move a little bit and make a bit smaller so we can handle them. Um, so we definitely have some clusters emerging. Yeah, so a lot of it revolves around teachers and, uh, and methods. Mm -hmm. And around the, the fact that there was no free time and no work-life balance. Um, okay. okay, and in university, nobody told me about the job possibilities outside of academia. So, Interesting. Um, so maybe that's around the too much theory and not enough application. Okay, so I'm just going to pick one. I'm going to be bold here. And I'm just going to pick a problem. So what we're going to do now, folks, is we're going to move on to another part of the board. So again, if you, if you zoom in and zoom out, you'll see that the board is very large indeed. And we've only used a very small part of it. So I'm going to pick a problem now. And I'm moving it down to the bottom left-hand side of the screen. So if you zoom in, zoom in again, or zoom out again, and down to the bottom of the, of the screen, in the left-hand corner, I'm making one of the post-it notes quite large. So I'm picking this one at random, and it kind of appeals to me because I do like working interactively with students. I'm not a lecturer, I'm a facilitator. So we're talking about not enough group working and very few interactions between the students during lectures. And I hope what we're creating here right now is a little bit of activity. So that is the problem that we're going to solve today. We're going to attempt to solve it. So if I could ask you to no longer concentrate in the problem corner, we're now moving down to the other corner of the mural where the large orange uh, problem statement is uh, displayed. Not enough group working and few interaction between the students. And what we've done here now, folks, is that we have defined a problem to be solved. And I hope you're all in the same corner of the mural board as I am now, and you're able to see that we are... Ah, wrong one. Wrong slide. Give me a moment. We're defining a particular problem to be solved. And this is the define stage. And what we're doing here effectively is that we have decided that we are going to work on one particular problem. And we are saying a problem statement, which would be 
students need a way, students and teachers need a way to interact because there's not enough interaction and it becomes quite boring and static. So we need a way to interact. We have to think about how can we better inter interact? And that's the problem that we're going to solve today. And I hope you're all down in the left-hand corner of the, of the whiteboard with me. And now we're going to move on to the exciting stage, which is how we come up with ideas about how we might solve this problem. So can you see the word ideate that I've just posted on, my, on the whiteboard? And we're going to come up with ideas. And we're going to do this in a particular way. If you look at the next picture that I've just put up, we're going to use some ideation techniques. And you're going to come up with one idea per post-it note, defer judgment. So this isn't about deciding at this stage whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. This is just about free flow of ideas. We're going for volume. It's a case of quantity over quality for the moment. We're just going to let go a little wild. We're going to encourage wild ideas. We're going to go for some blue sky thinking. We're going to go for blue sky ideas. And we're going to go for some quite grounded ideas as well, because sometimes the magic happens somewhere between the blue sky and the grounded ideas. I'm sure you're familiar with techniques like this. We, we have, a, of course, we call it brainstorming. And that's a technique that's used a lot. But we have another little technique for you, which is called brain writing. And that's similar to a brainstorming situation. But in the brain writing situation, people are allowed a little moment of peace and quiet to come up with ideas of their own before we begin sharing and before we go into the brainstorming activities. And this allows people to have their voice and everyone has a shared voice and it's a democratic experience. It's a little more effective than brainstorming, brain writing and brainstorming. So what we're going to do now for another uh, few moments is that you're going to let your imaginations go wild and come up with as many solutions as you can on post-it notes and pictures to solve the problem that there is not enough group work and there's little interaction between students during lectures. How, how would we solve that problem? Away you go and try and try and come up with some ideas. Go wild, take loads and loads of post-it notes and, and write your ideas on it and just post them all over the ID8 or all over the ID8 slide. So what, how would you solve that problem? I'm just going to tidy up these little slides a bit so you've got some room under ID8. Yes. I hope you can see where that is. And remember, you can move around your board and zoom in, zoom out. Things can, can do right. So, hope you're the having interesting thing is that we're interacting live on Mural and it's, it's very nice. And that <laughs> what we're speaking, Maurice, our audience is hearing this about half a minute later than what we're actually doing. So this is very interesting in this interactive session. Oh, well, um, yes. And we've got to become a little bit better at online interactivity uh, because uh, this is the world we live in now. And we're here in a virtual environment and we're trying to, trying to come up with ways of interacting. And it's live online. And there's the ideation place. Okay, so I'm seeing, the first, I'm seeing the first ideas coming up. So feel free to just be wild with how would you solve the problem of not enough group work and few interactions with students during lectures. So is ideation, question. Maurice, can you explain me a little bit whether ideation is the same thing as uh, brainstorming? Well, brainstorming is a, an ideation tool. All right. Uh, it's one way that we ideate. We can get ideas from anywhere, really. We can uh, borrow ideas. We can see what they're doing in other places. We can 
ask experts, we can gather from research, we can see what's been done before, we can have brand new ideas, we can have a mix and match of ideas. So there's lots of techniques that you would use to come up with ideas and brainstorming and brain writing are, are two of those techniques. We we'll just give people a few moments to have a, have a little think. So remember the problem that we're solving or trying to solve today is there's not enough group work and there's little interaction between students doing during lectures or during our educational experience. Let the students be teachers. Yeah. <laughs> Teachers, professors should form small random groups in order to meet new people and learn. Okay, somebody pasted here that they won't be that they came late and can't join the board. Um, I see that in the chat. So should we can you just quickly perhaps share your PowerPoint again with the link, Morris? Certainly, if I could share screen again for just a moment and I'll show you the, the, uh, the link. Share screen. Another thing I meant to mention to you folks is that there's a chat function here in uh, in in Zoom as well, or in Mural. Yeah. You can but see. But I can't see the screen yet. Uh, no, I'm I'm. I'm a, I was muted there for a moment. I beg your pardon, folks. I was muted. And I would like to share screen to show the link again, if possible. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Nick. And there it is. So the link is, uh, is there on the screen. It's a bit.ly link, it's a shortened URL and you need to write that link, take it down and type it into a browser, uh, preferably Chrome uh, or, and uh, hopefully we'll see you on the mural board very shortly. Okay, so what people are doing at the moment, if you've just joined us, you're very welcome. People are working over on a mural board. And what we're doing is we're trying to solve a problem. And we know that there are lots of problems in the education system. And you had lots of problems, perhaps in your education, all the way back from kindergarten, all the way through to through university. And we've highlighted one particular problem that we're trying to solve today that there is little interactivity in lecture situations or in a lot of education. It's a passive situation where the student is sitting listening. Uh, and what we've, we're trying to do even here today is that we're uh, creating a little bit of interactivity. So everyone is now ideating. They're coming up with the best ideas that they can think of for uh, to solve this problem of lack of interactivity. So people are coming up with some blue sky ideas. The wilder the ideas, the better. It's a question of quantity over quality when we're brainstorming and when we're ideating and we're coming up with as many ideas as we can. So if you've just joined us, you've missed a little bit of it, which is where we came up with the problem that we are solving. And we've now moved on to coming up with as many ideas as we can. 
So I'm just going to rejoin you now on the mural board and see how things are going. So have we lots Some of... Some wonderful ideas out there, Morris. Some really have good we? ones. Is it fun? I hope yeah. everybody's having a little bit of fun here today. And we are with 18 participants. That's fantastic. That's lovely. Okay, so what have we got? We've got some good ideas here. We've asked students what they would like to do in groups. Let the students be teachers. Small groups where everybody has roles and responsibilities. Encourage debate among small groups. Team building activities. Using social media. Short term assignments. Problem based learning. Teaching as drama. Isn't that interesting? Train teachers. I love to be that. Teaching as drama. <laughs> speed dating. <laughs> Stand up classes. Wonderful. These are great ideas. Keep them coming for another moment or two. We'll just give the people who've just joined us an opportunity to, uh, to join in. Lunch seminars. Really interesting stuff. Um, okay, thanks, Barbara, for sharing the link there again. Thanks very much, Barbara Jensen, for sharing that link. So, I think we've got some really good ideas to work with. Yes, and we'll be right with you now. Be right with you. So we're coming to the end of our ideation phase. And now we're going to move on and we're going to try and think about which of these are we going to choose? Barbara Deal, I'm going to let you choose the one that we're going to, to take forward. Oh, wow. That is, a, that is a tough choice. Um, Indeed. There are so many good ones. Um, and I see there are some few late additions here as well. Uh, more practical sessions, train teachers to be able to act as facilitators, not lecturers. There you go, Morris. Uh, pop one. sessions. Okay. Well, I mean, that, that obviously presupposes that pubs are open again. Hopefully, uh, it's some, some, sometime soon. Not in, not in Ireland at the moment, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, less competition between students, stand-up classes. Um, well, there's some wonderful things. But I am actually going to pick the one that kind of sort of struck a chord in my heart because, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a drama queen. So do teaching as drama. Do teaching as drama. That's the choice. That's the choice. And that's, where's it gone? Uh, it's right there. Um, exactly, can, there it is. We can zoom in and out, folks. So I'm gonna move that over to this and we're gonna move everything else now out of the way. So we're just gonna do a little tidy up there. And what I'm gonna ask you to do now, folks, is how would we show that? How would we sell people on this idea? We're going to do some teaching as drama. Uh, and what we're going to try and do now is that we're going to try and prototype that idea. How would we show that? How would we prototype it? How would we get into a situation where we're able to show somebody what we mean? Not to explain it all to them, but quite simply uh, show them a, uh, a prototype. And maybe we should uh, highlight here that prototype in this context effectively is a very rough and ready representation of um, how would you how would you try to convince someone with a very very rough sketch or with a very rough representation of your idea that um, you know we should be uh, we should be structuring. Uh, teaching as drama. 
Okay. So I know that maybe some of you with an engineering background probably have very uh, set ideas about what a prototype is. You know, sometimes when you're talking in engineering about prototypes, it's actually almost like a, a, a small version of, a, of already a bigger, a bigger machine. But actually in this context, prototyping really is a very rough and ready representation of what uh, of the idea that you are trying to convey to other people. Great. So do teaching as drama. So over to you, Morris, sorry. Great. So we're now moving over to the, to the bottom right-hand corner of the, uh, of the whiteboard, or the, right, the extreme right-hand side of the whiteboard. And we're doing do teaching as drama, and we're going to try and prototype that. And as Barbara Deal just said there, here's a couple of little prototyping rules for you. It's rough and ready. We build to think. Communicate at every stage. Test early, fail often, succeed faster. Various prototypes fit various different types of purposes, as Barbara was saying. And really, it's something that we can test with real users. Steve I think Job. We have to, sorry, sorry, Morris. Sorry to interrupt. I think um, we need to swap over now to your PowerPoint again, right? Uh, no, we're staying here on okay. the mural. Oh, we're staying That'll be the great. Mural. We're staying over on the right hand side of the mural. And where, we, where you can see the word uh, do teaching as drama and prototype. Can you see those words? I can't see them yet. Where have you put them? Ah, over, here you go. over on the right hand side. Yeah. Do teaching as drama, drama. prototyping, yeah. and a few little rules about prototyping there, a few little ideas on prototyping, which is uh, I'm sharing with you, and also a little quote here from Steve Jobs, who said that a lot of times people don't know what they want until you show it to them. So it's not about describing it or writing it, it's giving a visual, it's showing something, something that they can touch and feel uh, that we can test with. Jobs himself and the people at Apple, and I've just shared a picture of the first way, the first iPod. This is what people saw for the first time when they saw an iPod, was just a simple little cardboard box that let them know. Barbara, you were talking about engineers and computer engineers often might use something like a wireframe to, uh, to display how, it, how a website or an app is going to be. But what we're asking you to do here today is to create some sort of a visual, maybe a little napkin sketch, something that you can write there beside you at your desk, take a photograph of it and upload it onto the mural board. So we're looking for images now. We're not looking for words anymore. We're looking for images. What would teaching and drama look like? How would we test it? How would we prototype it? How would we, what would it look like? And we're going to give you a few moments to do that. And let's see what we can come up with on the right hand side of the mural board. Hope you're having some fun with this, folks. It's a little interactivity. A little bit of fun. So we're waiting for some images. Now I'm going to go over here and I'm going to again to the left hand side of the mural board and you'll see a, uh, a little column and one of them has mountains and a, and a sun, sun on it, like the symbol on a camera. And I'm just going to put in there teaching using drama. And I'm just going to see what I come up with. So we hope you're having a bit of fun, that you are 
sketching, that you are having, you know, ideas about how would you visually, how would you, how would you visually represent what teaching uh, um, drama is teaching look like? Teaching is, I think we're being a little dramatic here today. There's a bit of teaching with <laughs> drama happening here right now, live online. I know. I'd love to know where everybody is. Greetings from Dublin. A yeah. chilly autumn day in Dublin. Well, so I'm, opening, I'm opening the chat function here in Mural and maybe, maybe we can, you know, maybe people can just quickly just put in and say where they are joining us from. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? You see the chat function, folks? It has got a little speech box, a double speech box. So Dublin, Ireland. There. Okay, so That's where I am in Berlin, Germany. Is a little up at the top of beside the share button. Beside there is a little. I am double. hovering. I'm hovering over it. So beside the share button. Yeah, it's up there. It's got a little download button, and then it's got two little two little speech boxes bubbles together. We have London. We have Dublin, Berlin, Heidelberg, London, Antwerp. That's fantastic. Oh, Luxembourg. We're getting, we're getting some images. Uh huh. From Bonn. So the more images, the better. And if you're having trouble with the image, maybe you're sketching. Maybe you're sketching at your desk and you're going to take a photograph of it and upload it onto the whiteboard. You can drag and drop onto the whiteboard. That's what I've been doing in case you haven't noticed. I just have things on my, my desktop and I drag them over and drop them on the board. We have uh -huh. Bonn, we have the Netherlands. Where else are we to being joined from today? Open each lecture with an imaginative scenario. Lovely pictures of people doing drama. Happy children, drama queen. <laughs> what does that say, drama queen? Teachers prevent, oh, I've lost it. Oh, dramatic teachers prevent students from falling asleep. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> A little okay, more drama. So you could uh, you could draw this by I don't know lots and lots of uh, you know somebody with a little crown and a little scepter kind of in front of a whiteboard and just doing uh, doing a speech on quantum physics or whatever whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Or, for Eddie's example, we could write, you know, we could encourage people to write their lectures as a drama and, and as an interactive piece. Okay, so we have a first image here. Uh, let's see. Um, if you allow me, Morris, I'm going to put, uh, I'm going to delete your prototyping examples. Is that okay? So you can do have... whatever you like, Barbara. So Feel it becomes, free. It becomes a little less messy here. This is, a, you keep it tidy, Barbara, that's fantastic. This is just yeah. a little bit of activity. And if you zoom in and out again, you'll see all that we've done here in the last half an hour or so. We've populated an entire board with problems and ideas. And now we're trying to show the solution that we've come up with, teaching as drama. But we're just going to give this another few moments. Yeah. I like curiosity kills the cat. <laughs> <laughs> Which is that? And the nice, the nice part about this is that that actually this interactive session is pretty much a piece of drama. <laughs> where the audience doesn't yet really know where is this all taking to us, you know, why? I'm, I'm still why wondering where this? everybody is. Um, there's a little chat function, double chat. We have the Netherlands, we have Trieste, studied in Trieste, but cur currently living in Marburg. Absolutely. 
I'll have to do a little Google there on where Marburg is. I beg your pardon. But it's I'm a beautiful not. city. It's a is beautiful it? university town. Oh, that sounds lovely. And there we go. We've got lots of, of really cool things and, and uh, really interesting. I'm intrigued to know the, uh, perhaps the person, the lady uh, with the, uh, it's a black and white photograph. And she's, uh, who is that, I wonder? Forgive me if I should know. This one, yes. Maybe you could type into the, into the chat, whoever posted that. And tell us a little about it in the chat. Would that be okay? Oh, that's really interesting. I'm not very good with visuals. That's okay. We don't all have to be brilliant with, with uh, visuals. So sharing the prototype here is chapters would be acts. So a chapter of a book would be a different act. That's a really interesting way. Or social robot. Really good. Little bit of dance and drama. Open each lecture with an imaginative scenario. Tell a story, not a lecture. Okay. Hope you're all having fun. Convert, convert every lecture into a stage. Fantastic. <gasps> Fantastic. So a little bit of storytelling, a little bit of drama, a little bit of uh, imaginative scenarios. It's not just a a flat lecture it's a stage it's not a lecture a rostrum anymore it's not a podium anymore it's a stage and that's kind of interesting scenario i think that's really really very good okay somebody posted an image from there from 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 her work which is great oh yeah where can we see that um okay i'm gonna just delete a few pictures here just to make it less messy so if somebody is willing to already share their prototypes. Where, where is ah, that? Ah, all right, okay, yes. Oh, I like the sing and dance. That would be fantastic. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. I really think we will have to let this know to to the ministries of education and uh, bring forward <laughs> these ideas and uh, we will save them quite some consultancy in solving the education system. Mm -hmm. And Brussels is with us as well. And Brussels, thank you, Brussels. Thank you, Vinciane. You're enjoying, says so a good session, thanks. So listen, <laughs> folks, we're going to move on and it's been a little bit of fun, but I want to bring you back again now to uh, the screen. And I'm going to share my screen with you again. Um, we'll reluctantly leave, leave this part and, uh, and come back and maybe uh, time is slipping away on us and we could be having fun forever, but we better get back to business. So if I could, I'd share screen again now. Yes, you th I think you can, Maurice. Yeah. So uh, I'll just do that and that and that and that. And we're back. So I hope you can all see my screen now where we were working. What we've been doing, folks, you may realize some of you have may have heard of this before. Uh, maybe it's new to some of you. We've gone through all of us. In, in less than, uh, in about 40 minutes or so, we've gone through what we call a design sprint. We've used the basic techniques of design thinking, which is a human-centered approach to problem solving. Design thinking for products or services, or indeed life, is a very good tool to have in your, in your toolbox. Hopefully it's something that you might explore further if you haven't come across it before. We liken it to more to a musical instrument than a, a toolbox. And that perhaps fits with our dramatic issues that we were dealing with today. So practice makes perfect. It's something that you need to use regularly and to understand so that you can use it 
into for products, services, or indeed life. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. What most people do and what we are attuned to do as human beings is to come up with great ideas on the spot. We're paid for that. We're rewarded for that. We're educated to come up with great ideas. And often we start with our ideas before we have a real understanding of the problem. So understanding comes first. Understand the problem, really understand the problem. Again, I'll remind you that Einstein said, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about the solution. So design thinking starts with empathy and understanding. And it's a five-step process, empathy, defining the problem to be solved so that we really understand the problem and we define one. We can't solve all the problems in one go. We have to pick a particularly well-defined problem and then we start to ideate when we know exactly the problem that we're trying to solve. And then we find some way to prototype and test that solution. So it's an iterative process. It's not a linear process. And when we test, we may go have to go back and investigate again and do further exploration before we really define, redefine the problem, reframe the problem, and then ideate again. So it's a series of iterative, uh, it's an iterative process where we tweak and refine, try, ask, improve, and try again. In reality, it is very non-linear and we may have to bounce around between the various steps of design thinking. So when we go out and do our first prototype and test, we realize there are some issues. So we might have to go back and come up with some new ideas to overcome those. Or we may have to go back out to people again and we might go back to the observations, back to the research, back to the body storming, back to the listening, back to the observing. And then we go again and we try a second prototype that we test. And from that, we learn more. So it's a non-linear process. In fact, it's a squiggle a lot of the time. And I particularly like this one because when we're over here in the research stage and we're trying to see patterns and we're trying to get that problem to solve and we're reframing and re-understanding and listening more and having more conversations. It's a very messy process, not linear at all. But as we go on and we refine it and we become our prototypes improve and our tests are showing better results, we start to get clarity and focus. And now we have a well-designed solution to that particular problem. And I just want to give you a little, a little, uh, a little flavor of empathy in action. And I'm just going to start this and make sure that you can all hear it. So maybe Barbara, you mm -hmm. could tell me that that sound is good and that you're all you can see and hear. No sound. I think you have to pin your sound settings, Morris. Okay, so I'm just going to have to exit for a moment and yeah. stop sharing while I readjust my sound settings. I have, I have yeah. it now. Thanks, Nick. My mistake. I'm just going to. Just going to. Okay, I'm just uh, just making sure that I'm right this time. Sorry about this. And I'm going to back to Zoom now. And I'm just doing screen share and ticking sound share and share. And now I've, now I've started my PowerPoint again, thank you. Yes. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you for your patience, folks. I'm sorry we were, we're just 
just uh, experimenting here. So now I hope you have full sound and vision for this little piece, just under three minutes, about empathy in action. <laughs> used to this sort of foreigner wandering around. Initially, I was here to search for a remedy to a problem. Anemia, caused by a lack of iron in the blood. It causes dizziness and weakness. It breeds complacency and lethargy. Kids can't concentrate in school. It also causes premature births and problems during pregnancy for women. Nearly two out of three children are anemic. But this piece of metal has the power to stop it all. My challenge was to find a way to supplement the typical Cambodian diet of fish and rice. I knew that iron pills and other iron treatments weren't really affordable by many people in the villages. In my search, I found that cooking in a cast iron pot can release iron into the food and that iron is then absorbed in the diet. But I realized that most Cambodian women use aluminum pots because they're cheaper and lighter. And then I got to thinking, what if I could get them to put this chunk of iron in their pot? It would be a simple, cheap and accessible treatment that even the remote villagers could use. But my simple solution had one big problem found that the women were hesitant to add this sort of ugly piece of iron into their pots. I found that the iron blocks came in very useful, but just not in the pots. And so I realized I had to dig a little bit deeper. I searched for everything. I looked at sayings and beliefs. I looked at rituals. Anything that would give me a better understanding of Cambodian culture. And then I landed this, a symbol of good luck. I um, was a little bit shocked when I when I found out how uh, positive the findings were. In the test areas, anemia has pretty much disappeared altogether, which is absolutely astounding. It's, it was far exceeded what we had expected. We're hoping that this little fish holds the key to treating anemia across the region and beyond. It's definitely one lucky fish. So I hope you enjoyed that little video, folks, to just say that if we had, the idea was great, put a little chunk of iron in the cooking pot and everything will be fine, or take a little tablet and everything will be fine, or why don't we eat a little bit more healthy and everything will be fine. Sometimes the solution doesn't quite work. Because even though it's obvious, and even though everybody should, should do it this way, it just doesn't click because it doesn't, it doesn't engage. It doesn't really solve the problem. It causes other issues. It reasons why, why is that not working? It's such a wonderful idea. It didn't work. But when he dug a little bit deeper and when he researched a little bit more and when he got a greater understanding of those people, he realized that a little chunk of iron in the shape of a fish, now they'll use it because now it fits. The problem and the solution fit like a glove. It's that problem solution fit we're looking for. So that's just a little example. And when you've experienced a little bit of design thinking with us in the last uh, uh, hour or so, I'm just going to move on now to tell you that there is, all, there is another problem to be solved. There are many problems to be solved that we might be able to use the design thinking process for. But in our situation today and with the theme that we have and the theme of the work that uh, Bar the Barbaras, both Barbaras do in helping people to solve the problem of their career and solve the problem of their life perhaps. How do we do that? How could we use the design thinking process that might be useful to solve our career. Well, coincidentally, 
the people who, uh, who originally uh, designed thinking came out of uh, Stanford University and a company called IDEO. And design thinking has been around for uh, since the 90s, really, since the 1990s. But it's becoming much more universal and ubiquitous in terms of product and service design and process design. But the, these authors, William Burnett and, Jane, and David Evans, have now applied the design thinking principles to life. How do we build a well-lived, joyful life? I'm going to leave these some tips here. It's a framework. It's an approach. It's a technique, a problem-solving technique, evaluating different career paths and multiple careers, perhaps practical skills and if we remember it's about understanding it's about proto uh, defining the problem to be solved it's about coming up with a lot of ideas and prototyping and testing those ideas so perhaps we can do some self-empathy self-assessment work life what are our values what are our needs what, what, in, what do we enjoy? The good time journal. What engages us? When are we in what they call the flow state where time just disappears because we are so engaged? So we really do a lot of work in self-assessment, self-empathy, noticing what we enjoy and what we want and when we are at our best and when we are at our worst. And that is that empathy piece. Now it's for self defining, getting unstuck, reframing. If we kind of think, oh, that's not working, reframing the problem, mind brainstorming, mind mapping, coming up with ideas around maybe three life designs. So why not? We could have lots of different plans in lots of different ways. And then we could maybe interview people. We could have real life experiences. We could go out there and test we could build our dream job. We can choose happiness without agonizing over it. And we can prototype and test just like we would with a product or service. And I'm going to play another little video for you now, again, about three, min three four minutes. And this is from the authors of Design Your Life. And I hope that you get some inspiration from this as well. Designing Your Life is a guide to help anyone learn how to think like a designer in order to figure out what life and career it is they really want and how to get it. Designers approach problems in a particularly creative way. They begin by really trying to understand first what's going on and then they define what problem it is they're actually solving. Once they do that, they use design techniques to generate lots of ideas. And the better ideas they use to build little experiments. We call them prototypes, to try those ideas out. From the prototypes, they can pick their best ideas, the ones that really work for them. The first thing we do is we get rid of bad ideas. We call these dysfunctional beliefs. These are ideas that don't work, and they get people stuck. Then we give you a new idea. We call it a reframe. That gives you a new way of thinking and frees you up to be more creative. We've been developing Designing Your Life for over 15 years. We've taught to over 2,000 students here at Stanford, and we regularly hear back from our students three, five, even 10 years after graduation. And what we hear from them is, they're continuing to use the process, and it's really working for them. The research shows directly that people using our life design method to design their lives will have more ideas, be more creative, are less anxious about the future, and are more confident in their ability to build the life they choose. We find that most people who want help designing their life fall into one of three categories. They're in their early 20s, just starting out in their career, and don't really know where to begin. 
or people between 30 and 50 in the middle of a life and a career who are wondering if and how it's time to make a change. And then there are people who are in their encore phase of life. These are folks in their late 50s to their 70s and they're looking for the thing to do after their career. So they are really all asking the same question. What do I want to do with the rest of my life? And how do I get there? And our life design methodology works for anyone. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's about it from me. We've taken a little look at, oops, I beg your pardon. We've taken a little look at design thinking today. We've experienced a very, very short design sprint. And we've gone through the various, the five steps of, uh, of design thinking. And we've experienced that together in an interactive way. And I hope you've enjoyed it and found it uh, somewhat engaging. Remember the five steps of design thinking is a tool or perhaps more like a musical instrument that you need to practice. It's not a linear process. It can be confusing. But if we have that framework, we, we and then uh, take that framework and apply it to our lives and careers, it can be quite effective. Uh, so thank you for uh, bearing with us as we hacked the system today and, uh, and made it into, uh, uh, instead of just a, a webinar where you were sitting listening to me, we created a little bit of interactivity, which is the problem we set out to solve. And I hope you've enjoyed it. So thank you so much from myself, Morris Knightley at uh, Dublin, uh, UCD Innovation Academy from Barbara at Helmsholz and Barbara at DKFZ. And I'm going to shop, stop sharing my screen now and see if we have any, any questions from, from the audience. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you so much, Maurice. I mean, I really think this was an, a very exciting little tour into uh, design thinking. And uh, while well, we encourage now the people to put questions either into the chat on the, on the webinar or also on Mural if, um, if you are on there. And um, if, yeah, we will, we will be happy at the very, very end. I suggest that I will be able to share also what is on, on Mural, the final result, so to say, of this, um, of this, this session. That would be probably a nice, uh, a nice thing. I posted one question that, that came already. I mean, it's more a comment. Someone said, this is why it's so important for scientists to work with other stakeholders, for example, social scientists and the public. And, uh, and that's, I think, a very nice comment. That's absolutely correct, is that all those voices need to be heard. We really have to, at the beginning when we're trying, before we even define what problem it is we're trying to solve, we need to spread the net very wide. We need to hear those voices. We need that diversity. We need that input. We need to really understand what people are thinking and feeling and what jobs they're trying to do, what issues they have. What's the itch that we're trying to scratch, I suppose? We really need to dig deep. And that's a really, uh, uh, that's a, an insightful comment. And that diversity of view uh, is so important when we're trying to design. Yes. And what I also find, what I, what I also find very helpful in, in, um, in thinking, in, in applying, you know, the design thinking way of, um, uh, of problem solving, maybe to issues around, you know, choosing a career or or thinking of what might be the next steps is actually putting yourself into that experimental mindset where where you are trying different things and and uh, where you are um, where you are almost taking um, a very sort of uh, 
playful approach to saying, okay, I, I don't know whether I, whether this is going to be my career of choice, but I just give it, you know, I just, I just design a little experiment and I see whether I like it. And if I don't like it, I'll stop after two weeks or three weeks or whatever. Sometimes I find that obviously, of course, in a, in a career, um, uh, in a career building scenario, which is usually, um, a period of one's life that is very um, often sometimes, you know, people get very anxious. There is a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of not knowing whether this is going to be the right choice or not. But I think what design thinking does, it's, it's trying to take the stress out of, out of that process and saying, well, just give it a go. You know, it's, it's not, there are very, very few decisions in life that cannot be undone. This is exactly bringing it to a point for me, Barbara. So I, I cannot agree more to it. And how much I re discovered the book that Maurice, um, so the author of Designing Your Life, the book from, from Stanford by Bill Burnett and, and um, Dave Evans. Um, for me, as like, you know, I'm already 10 years into the job of a careers advisor. And, uh, and I think uh, it's really bringing it to the point of like, what, what we fear to try out things and, and bringing things together um, in terms of being open to what we really, truly, truly, truly enjoy in life professionally, because this is what we also spend most of our, our time in, and then create, design our own solution um, for, for that. And, uh, mm, and so this is really what I, what I, I, I can really recommend this because one question I'm going to read out now. So um, someone asked this question, session is great. And as someone who is looking for answers about what to do with my career, it would be great if you could share some further material about how to use design thinking for career building. So yeah. I would def definitely um, suggest the, the book design your life. Um, any other suggestions from, from you two? Well, well firstly, l let me add as well, by the way, Barbara, that uh, and, and for all the audience listening, that neither myself nor Barbara, either Barbara, we're not on commission from Design Your Life in Stanford <laughs> University. <laughs> We're innovating, folks. We're borrowing something that we know is working elsewhere. That's called innovation. But something that struck me when you were speaking there, both of you actually, and I, I'm not sure who we're exactly we're talking to, but I'm sure there are a lot of people from scientific background here. And there's a very interesting lady uh, from Darden University, uh, Professor Saras Sarasvati, who talks about us having different worldviews, depending on our experience and where we come from and our culture and our education, that we might have a scientific worldview. We might have a religious worldview. We might have a social science worldview. Or we might have an engineering worldview. And really what we're talking about here perhaps is having a, for, for this process, having an entrepreneurial worldview. And that entrepreneurial worldview means that we're not afraid to test, we're not afraid to take calculated risks, we're, we make the best of what we have and we mix it together in some way that has never been done before. And I'm always I'm curious in education, especially when I'm I'm working with scientists, especially, and I say to them, but your, your discipline, you don't expect every experiment to work. In fact, you probably expect most of them to fail. And then you find the one that works. And so how about applying that sort of a worldview to our careers? We don't expect our first decision to work. We don't ex expect every experiment to work, but we just do more experiments until we find the one that does work. And so we take that less worrying, less stressful approach to our careers as well, as Bar Barbara Deal called it, a lightness of touch or a little playfulness. And we test 
we ID, we, we empathize with ourselves a little bit more. We, we define things that we can do. We come up with lots of ideas, crazy though they may seem sometimes. And we, we see, is there a little way that I can prototype and test this without too much risk? And then try that and find the one that works. So lots of experiments, I think, is the answer. So um, we got a question here in the chat that uh, basically says, so um, at the end, according to your opinion, would Einstein get hired today? <laughs> well, I think I'll come back to the quote that interests me most. There's so many Einstein quotes, aren't there? The one that's, that he says, I'm not especially gifted. I'm not especially clever. I'm just very, very curious. And I think that curiosity fits with this process. It's that lightness of touch again. It's not being, not being afraid to experiment, not risking all. Let's keep the entrepreneurial worldview in mind. We only risk what we can afford to lose. So let's have some little small experiments that aren't going to ruin our careers or ruin our reputations, but allows us to, to test. And I think that's what Einstein would have done. He's very, he was so curious. He loved to find out about everything that he, did, that he didn't know. Everything fascinated him. So let's be more like that. And yes, I, of course, I think people like that would get hired today. I just wanted to also catch up a little bit and say welcome to Copenhagen, from the people from Copenhagen and Brussels and Bavaria and the Brit abroad, wherever you are. And we're happy to have you all with us. I just noticed <laughs> really? that we had... Some... So nice to see that this interaction is possible in an online <laughs> webinar um, setting. And we got some more we got some more questions, folks, here. We have, um, you know, if, we, we, we can fill the last few minutes that we have with a few more questions not, here. If, if, something's you... not, if something's not possible, Barbara Jensen, we find a way to hack it. There's exactly. always a workaround. <laughs> yeah. So, so okay, maybe I, so well someone says uh, I now feel so sad this is a virtual session and I cannot bug you with tons of questions over coffee break oh well okay <laughs> well I mean That'd you know nice. we, we send you we send you a big virtual hug and please feel free to contact us um, anytime I mean I, I think you know all of us are really committed to this to this idea of of helping people and enabling people to to think that that they you know that they're not that they're not stuck somewhere or that they are that they you know they can change and they can have wonderful and and fulfilled um, lives and careers and um, so um, yeah but let's let's pick um, last five minutes are on and I see there are other people already in the uh, in the virtual room somewhere. Um, there's very many many uh, suggestions actually so there's comments um someone says we definitely need more community outreach as a part of the phd program uh give students more um more out exposure yeah uh, and the community in general i think is a nice comment someone wondered whether you could replace design with question question thinking as a route not leading to prototyping but to come to valuable questions mm -hmm. um which is a very interesting way of um of, indeed of I, I think that 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 that's that's absolutely vital is that we continue to question and we don't just accept the, the one question as it is we take that question and we reframe it and we we reevaluate and re, we redefine the problem again and if we're still not coming up with a solution we go back again and we do further research and further empathy and we redefine again and we reframe again, and it's that constant uh, sort of iterate, iterative uh, methodology. And having that about our lives and our careers is, is certainly very useful too. And I find, I find, so I'm obviously, you know, I'm in, I'm in, uh, I'm in charge here of um, of trying to encourage. Um, you know, scientists and researchers to think about maybe transferring their research ideas into into a in, into an application or into you know into a product or a service or even even just a solution that that exists out there in the real world. And I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to to come up with with ideas of how to do that. And I I always find that you know there isn't 
again, like there isn't a linear way of just transferring science into an application or research into an application. What we find that it's also very much an iterative process. And, um, and, what, and when you talk to scientists and researchers who actually have gone down that route and they, they say, well, you know, I, I've, I've been trying to, to come to, um, to develop something, they find themselves very much enriched by that experience because that outside interaction has probably given them completely new ways of thinking about thinking about their work, thinking about their research. Um, and um, I, I always find that that you know when you see people who have gone through a such an such a personal enrichment experience that 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 is I I always I'm I'm always very happy about that. Because I think ultimately the solution that you will come up with will be stronger through that sort of interaction. And this is the very nurturing. So as we do everything the other way around in this session, and we didn't take a lot of time to properly introduce ourselves uh, more than saying where we're from, uh, I want to take one minute to just actually tell you how we got to organize this session and how um, with us as a Helmholtz Institute where we do career guidance and the Helmholtz, which is the organization that, that covers all, all the institutes in, um, in, in Germany, has the head of technology transfer being interested in offering design thinking for career development and, uh, and anything. So you wonder how how come and how come we're interested in working together with Maurice, who now offered us this, this extremely nice um, glimpse into what uh, design thinking um, it can be. And so um, from my part, I really want to say like, yes, this, this uh, encouraged me. I got to know Barbara Deal from the concept of saying like entrepreneurship. So having your own startup company basically yeah, is of course a career possibility for you as a scientist and um, and the interesting thing is that this is a mindset yeah it's not about taking the risk to start a company and and to have that as a as a job it's much more than that it's a it's a way of thinking uh, a way of living and uh, and I would like to launch that ball, ball, ball quickly back to you Barbara and and to ask you like you know how is entrepreneurship for you linking with design thinking on the one hand, and then um, training career development on the other hand? Well, I would, I would, I would say, you know, I would, I would echo um, what you say. I mean, this is, this is, I think, very much where, where we are dovetailing with um, a lot of the work that, that's been done at the, um, at the Innovation Academy, and that's where I know Morris from, because I, I used to work there. And, uh, and we were very much trying to see like, what is this, you know, what is this, what is the precondition for people to start a company, right? So because everybody thinks about that as some sort of, as, as if there is some sort of cookie cutter approach. You say you have a great idea and then you go and start a company. But then you, when you start actually digging deeper and say like, okay, so what does that also require you as, as, as an approach, as a way of thinking um, to to uh, to actually have to actually have that mindset of saying, okay, I'm I, I you know I'm trying to explore a problem first, and then I'm and, and then I'm coming up with a, with multiple solutions, and I'm going and trying and testing these solutions, and kind of slowly slowly inching myself forward to see what what is the best solution to to that problem. That is that is very much like how how you know, when you talk to successful entrepreneurs and when you talk to, or when you see the work that, for example, Sarah Saraswati has done is, is very much how they approach, how they approach this, this process of, of, of starting a company. It's not about this eureka moment, jumping out of the bathtub and saying, I'm going to start a business. It's more like slowly inching forward, slowly trying to see what, what, what I can find out using, using different, using and a very experimental approach, which is where, you know, scientists, I do think, have, have a great training and have a great background. And just trying to inch forward and, and approaching that and looking at the problem from various sides and then, and then um, trying to come up, you know, with, with the best solution to that problem. And then when that, when that problem solution fit is established to say, okay, now I have, you know, now I have a good precondition to make, uh, actually maybe go down that route. Of, of transferring that into yeah. into a company of its own. 
Thank you, Barbara. So, unfortunately, the last few seconds of our session are... seconds. So we really do want to wrap up with a, a quick word from, from each of us. From my part, the thing I like most about design thinking is the reframing. And to reframe, for example, stating happiness is having it all, to, um, to really stating that the, the reframe of that in terms of design, uh, design thinking would be to say happiness is letting go of everything you don't need. What about you, Barbara? <laughs> well, I think um, um, that that question of like, you know, reframing is, 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 I think is a very powerful one. I think sometimes we get held up by all the things that, that we think we lose by doing that, going down a particular route rather than by the things that we gain. And Maurice? And I would say thank you to all of you for coming today and stay curious. Stay curious. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you all.